Oh, it's it's live. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 110 that we've titled right now, pre-show, PF Sense Part 2. <coughs> we're going to find out from Tom that we're not actually talking that much PF Sense, but we're just going to ramble on like a bunch of two. Uh, testing, testing. Oh, Tom's <laughs> testing. Sorry. <laughs> I, I totally broke that. It's okay. I, I clicked a thing and then Audacity decided. And, and now you're great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm good now. I promise. All right. So let's start. We'll start over because it doesn't matter to us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 110 that we pre show named PF Sense Part Two. We're going to find out that we're not, we're, we are loosely talking about PF Sense and maybe the fact that it's P and F in some sense and there's a number two somewhere in it. But before we start, does everyone have their brackets filled out? We are approaching NCAA, and and I want, and I'm re reading this from a Twitter feed, Trump University in the Final Four. Personally, I, I think uh, in the upcoming Manila, Manila Major, uh, I've got OG Team Secret. Uh, I'm, I'm holding out for complexity, and of course, the fan favorites, EG. I want a CTF bracket. I want, I'm sure they have it. DEF CON, let's get on this. The, the hacker bracket? The hacker bracket, yes. That would be great. In my hacker bracket, I've got Ben 10, Dave Kennedy, um, Evan Booth, and Dan Wilkins. So, well, before we really... <laughs> We just, I, I do want to mention, I don't know if anybody mentioned, but uh, Diffie Hellman just won the touring award yes. for a million dollars. And he deserves so, every bit of it. So, I mean, I don't know if a million dollars is is a lot of money to them, but I, I, I think they're like tenured a couple times over at whatever university they're teaching at, at Stanford or Caltech. So I, I, I think the million dollars is a nice prize, but I, I do have to I do have to say I'm gonna I'm gonna echo a story that I read on on Hacker News earlier this week. Um, or not this week, last week uh, about Diffie. Apparently, they brought him into a court case. Uh, it was like a patent dispute um, involving public key cryptography, and uh, I, I want to say it was New Egg versus a patent troll, and the <laughs> the lawyer. Had Diffie on the stand, had Whitfield Diffie on the stand, and he asked him. He said, "Well, sir, do you know anything about public cre public key cryptography?" And Whitfield said, "Yes." So the lawyer asked, "Okay, well, why? How do you know about it?" And he says, "In of course, the most amazing way possible." He just says, "Well, I invented it," and everyone was just you know blown away. Diffie. It, it, dropped the mic and walked off the stand and everyone's like, Oh, and that was the end. That was the whole court case. I, 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 I guess inventing it is one thing. I really wanted him to say, you know, did you ever hear of Diffie Hellman? <laughs> I'm Diffie. Yeah. I mean, they, I, I know Diffie and Hellman more than I know the RSA guys. Yeah. Well, so oh, I'm going to forget the name because I'm a bad, bad person. Uh, but there's actually a third person, and I, I would like to make sure that they're known too. And I'm going to look up their name because, again, I'm a bad person and I've forgotten. So, so anyway, anyway, it's uh, it's very good to know with all this encryption debate that that uh, yes, Diffie Hellman and RSA are the leaders in this, and. And for your light reading sense, while Tom's looking it up, read the Apple briefing that that Apple sent back to the courts. If you can't read like me, go find Jonathan Zdarsky on Twitter, and he has a lot of Z with accents and <laughs> umlauts and other accents and weird like double consonants after the Z and everything else. But he goes through and he highlights the major points. And I had a thing this morning, and I'm going to ask Tom this. I think we should make all our encryption based on whatever the NSA does. So if they ask you to decrypt, the NSA would probably not want you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if the FBI says, Hey, you have to use this encryption with this backdoor, I really think we should force all encryption to use that, that to if force every government agency, every bank, everyone in America to use that form of encryption with those backdoors, including the NSA and the FBI. Because if I have to be backdoored, they have to be backdoored. 
And and to to answer the original query that I had, Whitfield Diffie, Martin Hellman, uh, and they do like to to make known that you know Ralph Merkel uh, was the guy who originally conceptualized public key protocols, uh, and he was just as instrumental in creating Diffie Hellman uh, as either Diffie or Hellman. Um, so they they like his name to be thrown out there as well. Diffie Hellman and what was it? Merkel. Merkel. Okay, so we have to the Diffie Hellman Merkel key exchange. Anyway, it was because and then and then on the jo- Jonathan Sudarsky said, well, and he did a great blog post. Why doesn't the NSA help? People are absolutely positive without Snowden really revealing anything. So we don't really know that the NSA could actually break the encryption. They are one hundred percent positive of this, but we don't really know. Well, I mean, it, it depends on the type of encryption, right? Um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you know most public key crypto with a sufficient key length or you know AES two fifty six, they're not going to be able to break. Um, but it, the the NSA doesn't really care about breaking cryptography. They they know, and this is this is even shown up in their slide decks that crypto takes a long time, right? If you don't get it in your standard word list right away, it's going to take a whole long time to, to brute force key your password space uh, to get into whatever you're trying to get into. The easiest way to get the information you're looking for is to compromise the endpoint. Send a phishing email, get someone to click on invoice.pdf.exe, you know, infect them with some awesome zero day that Microsoft told you about that they haven't patched yet, which by the way, yeah, that does happen. Um, or, or, when they go to buy a laptop or a piece of equipment, just have your truck pick it up before it gets to the destination, which, by the way, that does happen, too. Install your, your hardware key logger and then break into the guy's house later and get all the information off. Uh, there's Compromising the human is so much easier than compromising the tech or breaking the math. Did you ever buy a Best Buy optimized laptop for, and paid good money for no, it? No. No, I didn't. Well, that's a thing, and I yeah. think Best Buy has stopped it since, but you could pay Best Buy $60 to optimize your laptop. Now, I don't know what that means. I don't think they do either. Um, it usually means installing a bunch of Geek Squad spyware and, and nasty crapware on it. They're going to install uh, was it, VNC just so they can help you when you have a question and you get a free support ticket for 60 bucks. So the Geek Squad, who's not been known to be that upstanding, can now access your computer without you giving them the code. So anyway, yeah. But yes, as, as was... a general as a general tech guy, uh, please literally go to anyone else, like that neighbor kid down the street that kind of knows computer and he looks sort of nerdy. Um, give him twenty bucks or buy him an Xbox game or a gift card to somewhere. Steam gift cards work great. Um, and, or Amazon gift cards work the best. And, don't buy him beer. He's probably underage. Yeah, don't do yeah. that. Ama- just give him like a $50 Amazon gift card and take him to your computer and say, I broke it. Do not go to Best Buy under any circumstance. He's not trying to hack you. Or if he is, he's just trying to raise the temperature in your house. Yeah, he's having fun. Like, okay, so if your CD-ROM randomly opens, that's about it. I mean, it's... Uh, he means nothing by it. <laughs> He wants to make sure there's no uh, cup of water in there. He wants to make sure there's no dormant cyber pathogens. Yes. They use the word unicorn somewhere, I think, there. Uh, no, no. The, the person writing um, the, the response to dormant cyber pathogens used unicorns. Oh, okay. So, so we're, still, we're still dealing with the second half of the PF Sense build. So where we left it off is I had all the hardware going. And we started with the VLANs. But since Tom and I have both been really busy and can't agree on a time to sit there. And remember, when you cut Wi-Fi, lots of people get mad at you. So oh, unless yeah. I'm ready. So, I mean, when you have a baby who wants to know why Blue's Clues isn't working or a wife who wants to watch Netflix and you're sitting there taking out the Wi-Fi, basically you're stuck overnight doing this. And that's hard. So we're still working on that. But we're, we're working on setting up three different networks. One being my home network for me and my wife and the server, and then a guest network, and then an Internet of Things network, because we just hear more and more. If you haven't done the Internet of Things network, you really need to do it. Just it, It's so bad. 
that they're just it, everything is just being compromised left and right. It, it's really, really bad. Yeah, it, you know, the Internet of Things is really it's just someone saying, hey, look, electronics are cheap and ubiquitous and networking is so easy now because everything has Wi-Fi and everyone has Wi-Fi. Let's just throw, you know, a, a Linux kernel or a FreeBSD kernel on a random device, have it hooked to a network, and we will never worry about supporting that device again, right? Those devices, they're not going to see patches. Uh, they're not going to see anything. Like, there's the big players, right? The Philips Hughes and the Nest of the world are going to do a good job of supporting those products throughout their life cycle. But if you go down to Home Depot or Lowe's and you buy some no-name, you know, it, clearly Chinese-made electronic light bulb thing and hook it up to your home network, just know that a lot of bad things can happen, right? You don't know what's in those devices. You don't know how they work. You don't know what they're calling home to. And you don't know if they've got really bad security holes opened up from the outside, which we've so seen again, before, right? That's not conjecture. We've actually seen security experts take some of these things home and go, wow, this creates a telnet session out to the middle of nowhere in the Ukraine for no apparent reason. So we see uh, Krebs reported on this recently, and this is from Security Now. Basically, they found out that HVAC vendor Train had three vulnerabilities on their LCD screen. Basically, they hard-coded the wireless network password. So somebody can SSH into your uh, air conditioner and... And then you use, use that as a pivot to get into your network if you've hooked that up. Um, some of these things create their own... Wi-Fi networks. I know there was a, a recent story in Hacker News about um, these no name, and they didn't really have a great brand name, or I can't remember a great band, brand name for it, but these light bulbs that generate a hidden wireless network, and you can get into it with a hard-coded password. And then from there, you've got root on a light bulb, and then you can pivot wireless networks over to your network. Meaning, if you've got these light bulbs on and active, someone can jump into the light bulb, then into your home network and do whatever they want there, right? Your Wi-Fi password is no longer protecting you because there's a, quite literally, a backdoor network connected to yours. I muted, I got muted for a second. It's, it's one of those things as I hear all these different choices, I just, uh, I, I want to start moving faster on this, but it's not me that I'm worried about. I know what I'm doing and I'm careful and this and that, but as my garage door gets installed and the garage door can talk to the nest and can talk to the Phillips hue, I'm just afraid that all these other things are going to come out and we're going to get stuck. So, so it's not just me that I'm worried about. It's the war driving people and everything else that's, that we're going with. Right. The, you know, the, the people, I don't think the NSA really cares about most people's light bulbs. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, they, they have talked about uh, using the internet of things as ways into your home. Right. They said, yeah, well with the encryption debate, that's, you know, it's an issue because more and more things are using encryption, more and more people are using end-to-end -end encryption, and it's really hard to break that. On the other hand, everyone's got Wi-Fi-enabled light bulbs, which are creating backdoors into their home network, so we don't really care anyway, right? The FBI knows that they can use uh, the Internet of Things, the Internet of Insecure Things, uh, to get into people's homes and spy on them if they need. Uh, and these manufacturers are used to putting out advice uh, putting out a SKU, three months later saying, okay, that product is now end of life. We're going to put out the next thing on the shelf. They don't want to support it. They don't care about supporting it. It's not in their business model or plan to support these things after they've released them. You know, it's it's clearly a, a manufacturing arm. You create a, a piece of merchandise, sell it, and then you're done with it. It's a very typical way to do a, a product launch. Um, and now we've got these things with networks and computers, and they just think they can stamp it out and be done. Anyone who's even a little versed in computer security knows that when you connect something to a network, you can't just call it done. You can't just say, okay, that's the end of it. Um, you don't get updates. That's not how this works. That's not how to be a, a good digital citizen. 
Well, you have, again, this is probably a fight between, I'm sure that these people have computer security people there. I'm sure there's security researchers there telling the sales team, you can't just end of life this. You can't just end of life something that's three years old, something like a thermostat that's three or four years old. People keep their thermostat for 30 years. So you can say, you know what? It's 10 years old now. We kind of want, like a smoke detector is a 10-year lifespan. After 10 years, that's something you can say, you know what? It's time to move on. But like 18 months on a phone when they're selling phones for three years, you got to You got to keep that longer than what you think the life cycle is. Well, and you know, I don't think a lot of these companies have security people. Um, I, I think they've got they've got some developers, right? Some some people whose job it is to it literally their only job is make this thing work like this. That is their job. They don't care how, they don't care why, they don't care what it takes. They just say make the light bulb change colors when they hit this button on the smartphone app that doesn't work properly on Android. Um, and it's the developer's job to make all that stuff work as best that they can within you know 30 days before we go to market. And it's it's very stressful. I'm a developer. I, I get the issues. I get the hardships. I get the crazy inane deadlines from managers that don't understand this stuff at all. Um, I've been there. I've lived it. And there there's no security people uh, that that are in these positions most of the time. Most of the time, it's just people writing software to get through a deadline so they can keep feeding their kids. Um, now, if there, if there are security people, because I know Nest, Nest has got security people. They've got people on staff saying, this is a vulnerability. This is how you design this safely. Uh, this is how we keep people from getting owned. Um, and they're a really big company, right? They're one of the most prominent Internet of Things companies. A lot of these people, uh, especially the small players, don't have anyone like that. Right. They might have a, even you know, a two person development staff. They have no one concerned about security. And most developers, you know, frankly, don't care about security. They care about meeting deadlines and getting the stuff working. And unfortunately, the more you connect, so all these things want to connect with one another. So the more you connect, the more the more vectors that you have. But my question, let's move on to going back a little bit to PF Sense. We were talking about VPNs. And you said something, and I was talking to you about how I want it, how easy it was to set up the VPN. So I'll let you talk about, uh, I guess, open VPN versus the whole house VPN or whatever you want to talk about there. Um, yeah. So, so I've got a, a, a system set up at my house, whole home VPN. Um, literally every ounce of traffic, except for that on an exception list, goes out a VPN connection, right? Time Warner can't get their, their grubby little eyeballs into my internet traffic um, unless I add it to an exception list. Everything is thrown into a VPN tunnel and then goes out to the net. Um, I, I do that for a couple of reasons, mostly because Time Warner Every ISP takes your browsing information and they package it up, they semi-anonymize it, and they ship it off to marketers. And they say, look, we have uh, this many internet subscribers that like uh, gaming and watching gaming streams and buying stuff on Amazon, and they like technology, right? That would be my profile. Um, and they, they package that up and they sell that bundle to marketers. Uh, I don't really like that idea, Um you know, I pay Time Warner for the internet connection. I don't want them selling my data. Uh, I was never asked. I don't get the option to opt out. I mean, that doesn't necessarily bother me all that much, but the, probably the next thing does. Right, right. Uh, and, then, and then the issue is anytime you go out to a site, no matter what site it is, no matter what you're connecting to, and most sites you connect to like, you know, five to 30 different hosts, depending on the site, um, know your endpoint. They know your IP address. Uh, they can trace it back to, you know, at least a subscriber line. Not necessarily to you personally, but they know your household, right? You are this IP address on the internet. I mean, not only that, they know your general location. Yes. I mean, yes, you they look do. at because they're not using the IP. They're using with the D, uh, the reverse DNS lookup. Is that the name of it? Right. So they, the thing that gives you your location and then some other information about it. Right. They, they can see sort of the host name of your connection, which, you know, in my case would be uh, pointing me to Western Ohio Time Warner Cable. And they know, oh, hey, hey, this guy lives in really this area of the country um, and he gets this Internet service. 
Um, just about everyone has got something that'll point them to a general location on the net. So how many political ads did you get in the last week? I, I run ad block. The, no. the only political say- ads I've seen are the signs sticking in the grass outside. Okay. I mean, not, I mean, not just that, but nobody, I, I mean, living in New Jersey, we pretty, we're at the end of the primary season. We know a lot of this. I, I don't generally get primary. I just generally don't get advertisements because none of the none of the elections are contested. But I can see them absolutely using that data. Oh yeah, up Time Warner yeah. saying we want to advertise to anybody in these counties yeah. who had who are Republican or Democrat or Independent to get those votes out. Yeah. Oh yeah, they so, they totally do. And I mean, look, like I said, advertising is advertising. I'm not generally worried about it because I know that I'm paying them and I'm being the product and everything else. But I think it's more of what else are they doing with it that we're not really sure of? Who are they giving this stuff to other than Target and Walmart and Costco and Amazon? Yeah. Yeah. So I've got whole home VPN, but that doesn't keep you anonymous. And someone might say, well, you know, and you know, I, I had a, a conversation with um, uh, another security buddy of mine um, where I was saying, you know, hey, look, this is I, I paid for this um, VPN connection uh, with Bitcoin. And if I wanted to, I could use a trash email address and I would be you know, anonymous to the VPN provider. And he pointed out, yeah, you wouldn't actually be anonymous. Um, traffic on the Internet coming from a single host is very unique. Um, you know, your, your traffic is not anonymized when taken in aggregate. Uh, and I'll get why Tor works in, in just a bit. But if you take every connection coming out of your home and, and you take that and you make a fingerprint of it and you compare it to everyone else's, you know, complete traffic list fingerprint, everyone's going to be more or less unique, right? You're going to fit into very small buckets, even if you match with another person or another household. So taking all of your traffic and forcing it to a VPN provider will not keep you anonymous. It is very easy to go back and find you in your fingerprint of traffic, um, especially if you run updates of any kind, right? Uh, in, in Debian, yeah, you have the option to share system information, uh, depending on what package as you install. Uh, on Windows, every time you go to Windows Update, Microsoft sends off a unique identifier saying, hey, this computer wants updates, right? It's so they can count and tally and see what's taken updates, what is failed updates. There's a lot of metrics they get from it. Uh, if you run Windows 10, it, they know basically everything you're doing. Uh, OS, I mean, they know you're first born. Yeah. <laughs> Windows 10. They probably own it too. I haven't completely read the EULA yet. So. Well, I was going to wish that, you know, those tech scammers that call you saying they're from Windows tech support. Maybe I kind of wish that they would get my traffic so they would know that I don't run any Windows machines. Yeah. So they don't have to call and say, do you have any, win- uh, we noticed on your Windows machine. I said, the only Windows machine I have is a TiVo. Maybe you can get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, like, uh, People running OS 10 aren't free either because Apple also sends out unique identifiers when it comes to iPhones, iPads, they send out serial numbers, right? So you can take that data and aggregate um, and you've got all these unique identifiers running around on one network. Yes, it's you. We know it's you because it's all of your stuff on this network. So you are not going to be anonymous to a VPN provider at all. Um, the reason the Tor browser works and is different is because you're not taking your entire connection and forcing it through Tor, right? You're, you're running a Tor browser and only those things in that browser will be uh, part of the connection set going through the Tor network. Um, so you're, you're really fitting in uh, a lot of the time unless you go to very, very unique websites or you log into Facebook on the Tor browser which please don't do that. <laughs> that completely defeats the point of the Tor network. Um, that's actually the reason why I abandoned my project to do a uh, whole home Tor VPN is because there's no point. When you're sending all of your traffic through a node, uh, the stuff coming out the endpoint identifies you, right? So you would be completely identified at the end of the Tor node as this dude is using the Tor network and getting on that list uh, probably isn't a great thing either. I love the Tor network, uh, but you know, using it and then purposefully de-anonymizing yourself kind of hurts you. Uh, it, it's a negative. 
Well, look, I haven't pl- really played with Tor yet, only because that's the next step. But I was really interested to see what you were going to do with that whole Tor thing. And the first question was, how is the speed going to be? Like, we already know that it's going to lower the speed, but well, it depends. So, so Tor, Tor definitely will, definitely will. It's gotten a lot faster uh, in recent years than it has been. Uh, but Tor, in all cases that I've ever used it, does slow down the connection by a wide margin. Now. Whole Home VPN, I have experienced faster speeds using VPN than I have without. Well, I've heard that. Like, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense, but apparently with all these, if you want to call them peering agreements with the different ISPs, running Netflix or running any sort of one-way traffic tends to be faster because they're not making these agreements and they're not purposely slowing things down. Well, there's, there's a stuff where you can avoid, you know, because Time Warner and several ISPs were, you know, slowing down YouTube traffic, for instance. Now, that is illegal, uh, but I'm sure there's still some traffic shaping going on, uh, however small. Um, But uh, OpenVPN in particular, uh, most VPN providers are utilizing compression. So if you're just sending over text data, um, that gets compressed before you send it uh, or as you're sending it and gets decompressed on the other side. So it will send way smaller information uh, than it would normally. And you'll receive smaller information than you would normally. Uh, If you've got an underpowered processor uh, on your, your VPN endpoint, which mine is APF sense box, uh, it can slow things down, but for the most part, you won't have to worry about that. So, well, I mean, my thing is now with going back to PF Sense is is I made the Raspberry Pi VPN, which again wasn't the hardest thing in the world to do. It was definitely more advanced, but we found out something of driving me nuts that it doesn't work on IPv6. It just drive. How would you figure that out? What I did is it it didn't do the loopback on my own network, which is one thing that I have to work out. So I connect to my LTE network on T-Mobile. Turns out T-Mobile uses IPv6. So first off, kudos to them to being IPv6 compliant. But it wasn't working. So then I try at school and I'm calling Tom saying, how come this site works, but this site doesn't? We couldn't figure it out. And then I realized... Hold on a second. Why am I on LTE not working, but Wi-Fi I am? Turns out they don't support IPv6. So now I have to ask Tom, should I create uh, this OpenVPN work, IPv6 work on PFSense with OpenVPN, or do we need to create a PPTP tunnel to make that happen? Um, It should Now, depending on what T-Mobile is doing on their IPv6 network, I mean, I need to figure out exactly where in the chain that's breaking. But um, from everything I've tested, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Uh, But then again, you know, networks and there's a bunch of variables there. So for me, that's that's the next thing. I mean, generally, I... Like I said, I'm obscuring my traffic from the person at the local coffee shop. I'm not trying to do anything more than that. Right. So for me to connect back to my house is not a problem. The next thing would be to, so what I really want to do, because I have this Raspberry Pi, it works awesome. You use that as my main one. And then use PF Sense as that whole house VPN that you're kind of describing. And if I had something, if I needed to do I can do it on there as well rather than building another Raspberry Pi to do that. Well, the great thing you can do is you can have it all. So you can have whole home VPN. So all of your internet traffic goes to a VPN provider and your ISP sees nothing except encrypted traffic, which is great. Um, And you can have the remote access set up. So you can use OpenVPN to uh, VPN back to your home if you need to access local resources, or if you would like to jump back to your home and then out through the VPN, which I like to do occasionally. Uh, so it's it's great. You can have everything with PF Sense. You don't have to have just open VPN clients. If you wanted to, you could have like six open VPN clients. And depending on the computer you've connected or the website you're going to, uh, you can set up source and destination rules to forward through different VPN endpoints. So you can say, well, if I'm going to Google, you can stick to the USA. But if I'm going to Facebook, take me to Sweden. If I'm going to Netflix, go to France because I want French Netflix. I mean, that's 
Look, that's pretty powerful. And and so then my next question to you is how hard is this to set up? And you said it was way easier. So the uh, remote access, trivial for PFSense. They literally have a remote access wizard. You go to wizards and you click next a few times and you fill some stuff out. It's really easy. Um, for the whole home VPN, a little more complicated, but I will have a blog post out soon. I'm tightening it up. Uh, that's going to have screenshots and it'll walk you through exactly how to set up whole home VPN using PFSense. So, I mean, I'm going, I'm trying to go through the wizard now and I have to get through some stuff, but it does seem all I got to do is fill out these boxes and there's Google to help you figure that out. So, yep. And I'm sure there's a whole there's a whole tutorial and everything else. So oh yeah. So I mean, the last step that we have to do with PF Sense, and like I said in the beginning, we have to figure out how to get these three VLANs working together, and then throwing off our Internet of Things there. But yes. as I go through all these settings, there's just so much that. But the great thing is, is that if you don't want to do anything, it's there. But if you want to do anything more than nothing, you can do it also. Oh yeah, yeah. PF Sense is only as complicated as you make it, and it's not that complicated in the sense of well, they make these routers that have really simple software design, and you give them a nice password and this and that. But this, I mean, this 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 is as, it's prettier than I expected. But it's if you just let it go and you just look at the dashboard, it's simple to use. That's oh right. yeah. Yeah, you, you can you can leave it really basic or you can go absolutely insane with it. So anyway, I hope you learned something more than than whatever. But here we, we were talking about PF Sense, but we still need a lot more to go. And in the meantime, I guess that's it. We should wrap up and I guess we'll see everyone next week. See you, everyone. Bye. Okay. Bye.